Okay, so in this video, I'm going to be talking about the uh, physical interpretation of all the math, all the linear algebra I just did. And I'm going to be saying a lot of things that are going to be strange if you've never seen them before. But, you know, the most practical thing to do is just accept what I'm saying as truth and just use it. And as you do more quantum mechanics and use these facts, it will become more clear to you. Uh, so the first thing to do is, uh, the first thing to mention is the most fundamental object in quantum mechanics, which is the state vector. And we can think of it just like we thought of the vector in the last video. And just like we expanded that vector as a, we wrote it as a linear combination of basis vectors, we're going to write our state vector as a linear combination of basis state vectors. And basically, if you know the state vector as a function of time, then you know everything there is to know about your system. And here I've just noticed I've written the time dependence of my state. Uh, the time dependence will be in these coefficients of my basis state vectors. So, you know, obviously, if, if the coefficients change with time, then the vector changes with time. Another factoid is that it's only the direction of our vector that matters and not its magnitude. And what I mean by that is that uh, this vector will represent some physical state. And if you multiply by your state by some in general complex number C, that does not change the physical state that the vector represents. So if I have these two vectors here, they both represent the same state because they point in the same direction, basically. Uh, and their magnitude is different, but that doesn't matter. So it's kind of only the relative values of C1 and C2 here that matter and not their you know, absolute value. And you can use this fact to what's called normalize the basis states or not the, well, sorry, not the basis states, but normalize the state vector. And we'll see why we do that very shortly. But basically, if you, you normalize this state vector such that the inner product of, of the state vector with itself is 1. And if you work that out using the linear algebra we, did, we uh, derived, or <laughs> not derived, but uh, talked about last time, then we get that the norm if I write my state vector like this, then the, its uh, inner product with itself will be this. It'll be the modulus of c1 squared plus the modulus of c2 squared, where modulus squared just means take the thing and multiply it by its complex conjugate. And we want this to be 1. So if this isn't 1, then all we have to do is divide by the square root of this number. And then we'll have new coefficients that do satisfy this property. And we'll see why we want to do that later on. Uh, and, I mean, very shortly. But first, I need to talk about our basis vectors. Because we know we want to expand our state vector in terms of these basis state vectors, but how do we know what state vectors to use? And so basically, the way we do that is we need to talk about operators. And in quantum mechanics, Every physical observable quantity, like energy or angular momentum or momentum, anything like that, there will be a corresponding operator. And I've just written a general operator O here. And when you make a measurement on some quantum mechanical system, you only get certain values. So let's say you measure O. You measure uh, some system. You measure O in that system. And the values you get are either OA or OB or OC, or there can be many other measurements, but, you know, whatever. You, you only make certain value, get certain values when you make measurements. Basically, for every value, every different value that you measure, you're going to assign a basis vector. And you're going to label that basis vector by that value. And so you will write your state vector as a linear combination of these basis state vectors. So 
In this example here, let's say you are measuring some quantity in some system and you only ever measure uh, two different values, OA and OB. Then you would write your state vector as some linear combination of these two basis state vectors. And the physical interpretation of this is that the pro if if you're you have a uh, you know system in this state, then the probability that you measure the value O A when you measure O is going to be the modulus of C A squared, and the probability that you measure O B when you measure O is going to be the magnitude of C B squared. And this is why we normalized our states. If we didn't normalize them, then the expression for the probability would be slightly more complicated. But if we normalize it such that this is one, then um, obviously that makes sense because if these are, if you can only ever measure OA or OB, then the sum of the probabilities of measuring A and B must be one. <clears throat> so, yeah, just take that all in, and uh, yeah. So the next thing to talk about, another property that these basis states will have is they have a uh, unique property when acted on by the operator corresponding to, you know, that base vector. So the linear algebraic term is that our these basis vectors will be eigenvectors of our operator. And all that means is that, you know, in general, when you act an operator on some state, you get some other state. Well, for an, if your vector is an eigenvector of some operator, then that means when you act on that operator, you get the same state back, just multiplied by some number. And in this case, when we act our operator O on our state, we just get the state back multiplied by the, uh, what's called the eigenvalue of that state. So the eigenvalue is just the uh, the value that you measure, um, you know, when you measure O, that corresponds to the state. So uh, that's just the terminology. We have this base vector here that I've labeled with OA. Uh, it is an eigenvector of the operator O with eigenvalue OA. And similarly, OB is an eigenvector of O with eigenvalue OB. Okay, so another thing we have is the expectation value. And what that is, is basically a way of calculating what you will measure in your state. So it's useful to think of your operator O as kind of a measurement operator. And basically what happens is if I squish my operator between uh, my base kets, any you know, two pair of cats, I will get the value that I would measure in that state. So if I take OA here and I compute this, all I do is I use this eigenvalue, eigen, eigenvector eigenvalue relation to compute O acting on OA. So that will just, you know, I'll just get OA here. And this is the eigenvalue and it's just a number. I can pull it out of this inner product. And then I'll just have an inner product of a base vector with itself, which is, you know, we're assuming these are normalized. So this is one. And all I get is OA. It's just the value that I measure in that state. So it's kind of a way of getting the value that you would measure if your uh, system was in this state. And then it works out in a similar, similar way for the OB eigenstates. But what about my general vector that is a linear combination of these states if I compute the expectation value of O in this state. Well, you can work this out by just expanding psi in terms of these, you know, write it as a linear combination of these base kets and bras. And uh, you can still, again, you just use the eigenvector eigenvalue relation. So O acting on OA will just, uh, you know, pull out an OA, and then O acting on the ket OB will bring out an OB. And then you can just FOIL this, and you know, there's four terms, but 
the only terms that are non-zero are the terms where you have an OA, inner product of OA and OA and OB with OB because, you know, inner product of OA with OB is zero because they're orthogonal. And all of that I get is this. And this is not in general equal to OA or OB. And that's kind of a contradiction of what I said before. I said the whole reason we chose you know, OA and OB as basis vectors is because the only values we ever measure are either OA or OB. So how can this represent the value that we measure when we're in this state? And basically the way it works is this is the average value that you would measure in this state. So if I had an, like an ensemble or basically a bunch of copies of particles or of systems that were all in this state and I made measurements on that system, I measured O in, that, in all of the systems, every individual measurement would either be O, A, or O, B, but the average value, if I, you know, did a, 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 the limit as I do an infinite number of those measurements, the average value I would get is this. So, you know, for example, if I had three systems and I measure, um, and let's say the two values are one and minus one, and I have three systems and I measure one in, for two of the systems and minus one for another one of the systems, well, every individual measurement was either one or minus one, but the average value is one minus one plus one, which is one divided by three. So it's one third. So the average value doesn't have to be, you know, either OA or OB. So uh, that's what the expectation value really tells you. And of course, if you're in the state OA, then the average value, well, you, you always, you can only ever me measure OA. So the average value that you measure is just going to be OA. Similarly for OB. And I think that's all that there is to talk about. So just take that all in and we'll show how to use this and we'll examine an actual system in the next video.